How are we doing? Halfway through the best month of the year? May all the best people have their birth- all the best people have their birthdays in May. I share my birthday with uh, David Beckham and Princess Charlotte. Say no more. Uh, if you need a, a quick stretch or a turnaround or, a, or a kind of get yourself in gear, uh, do that. But let's just pray again. Uh, that the Lord, Father, we pray that you'd help us to see. Ultimately, Lord, we are praying that we would see you more clearly in the context of uh, all that is going on in life, finances and everything else. Lord, we want to be those who hear your voice and see you more clearly and know your, your love for us and your leading of us in this life for your glory. Amen. Um, and I want to commend those uh, things that are going on in the life of the church, by the way, the Learning Hub and things like that. I know that uh, plenty of you gathered last Tuesday for uh, the first session that Hills did on the Kingdom of God. The next one's coming up this Tuesday. Uh, really want to commend that to you. Don't have to have been to the first to go to the next one. Uh, Andrew's seminar this afternoon and all of these things. So, And welcome to you if you're new uh, from me as well. I'm Tim. And I have the privilege, again, of going out with a small team uh, towards the end of this week to Kenya. We have... Uh, wonderful friends and partners out there, and we have the opportunity to go and do different things. And they've asked us to come back and do some more training uh, on the discipleship program called Rooted in Jesus. They're gathering all their leaders, all their clergy. So a small team of us are going to go and do that. And I've had the opportunity to go a few times now over the years. And one of the things that I always come back with uh, from Kenya, amongst many other blessings, um, is the sense of, gosh, uh, life seems much more simple. And I'm not going to fall for the kind of crass comparisons between cultures and, you know, make, make, make the kind of wrong assumptions and con- draw the wrong conclusions from that. But there's just something about the simplicity that we enjoy out there. And sure, part of it, frankly, is because uh, we don't have to do any cooking or washing up or cleaning or run anything. We just got, we're very well looked after. And we just have to focus on the thing that we do. And we share the whole load of other responsibilities that happen here. I absolutely get that. But beyond that, there is just something about fewer entertainment options, uh, fewer distractions to some extent, um, and just more space kind of created for connection and chatting and hanging out and relationships. And it helps you just to, it helps me anyway, just to kind of breathe a bit more deeply. And I come back often going, asking the Lord, you know, these competing thoughts in my head, is that just, you know, the culture and life there, and this is the culture and life here, and the, this idea of just living more simply, living with a greater simplicity is just a, a fancy in, in really complicated 21st century challenge, it's just not a thing. Or is there something to that prayer, Lord, what, what, does it, what would it mean to carry something of simplicity into this environment? And then the next morning I'll ping on uh, you know, the, the laptop and a hundred emails will come up that I've got to answer. And, and something from uh, EE on my phone will come up and it'll say, Tim, it's time to upgrade your phone. You've got to upgrade your phone because, you know, without it, you know, life will fall around, fall around your ears and it'll be a total disaster. And it just makes us reflect on those sorts of things. And I get faced, we all get faced, but it's when you have that kind of contrast, you get faced with one of the most powerful forces underlying the culture that we all live in. in, For the purposes of this message, I'm going to call it affluenza. There's all kinds of powerful forces. I'm going to call it affluenza. And one of the messages of affluenza, which is a serious dis-ease, it is a disease, and and the, the, the virus carried by the disease of affluenza that flows around the bloodstream of our culture and us, if we're not wise about it, is that. Upgrade your life. How? By upgrading your stuff. You need, you need the new upgrade on the phone because otherwise it's not going to go well with you, is it? Upgrade your life by upgrading your stuff. And if you don't upgrade your stuff, by the way, of course, what, the, what, that, what will happen is your life will be downgraded. That's the, that's the, the, the virus that the affluenza carries, isn't it? And by stuff, by the way, I'm going to use the word stuff a lot in this message. I'm shorthand for uh, money and all the things that money can buy by way of stuff, things, physical things, and, but also uh, experiences and, and, and so on. You know, bigger bathrooms, um, fancier holidays, nicer sunglasses, more beauty products, more comfortable cinema tickets, all that kind of thing. So you upgrade your life. You get the good life, says Affluenza, by upgrading your stuff. Friends, one of the most important things I want to say this morning again, I think, is that there is a good life on offer. There is a good life to be accessed. There is a God life to be accessed. 
This is the best news in the world for every man, woman, and child, and we, and we carry it and have the privilege of carrying it. It's what Jesus would call life in all its fullness, or flourishing, or being f- fruitful, albeit in a broken world with broken and weak people like you and me. But there is a good life. There is a, a God-given good life on offer. And we have a deep sense of that, actually, as creatures made by a creator in his image. We carry a deep sense of that some way. We may not be able to articulate it. it we may feel that it never happens. But we, all of us, man, everybody carries that because we're made in his image. If you go back to the beginning of the book, part of it is related to what does it mean to be, in God's design, human beings fully alive and flourishing, Life as God was intended to be, and we get a great picture of that back in the... I haven't got time to go back there, but what would it include? It would include things like feeling an inner peace. It would include things like knowing who I am, being secure about who I am. It would include things like knowing and experiencing myself to be loved unconditionally and accepted and carrying a sense of meaning and purpose and significance and contributing usefully and fruitfully into the society in which I've been planted. All of those kinds of things and many, many more. All the kinds of things of the good life for which Jesus died, into which he then wants to release us in relationship with him and in harmonious and loving relationships with others. That is an extraordinary picture of the good life with God. Broken, fractured, imperfect here, one day perfected in heaven when we go to be with him. And absolutely none of it depends on going after more stuff. Does it? And lots and lots of things, actually, that do contribute towards us pursuing that good life, going after the good life, upgrading towards the good life. But going after more stuff is not one of them. Because the good life is not for sale. It can't be bought. It can't be earned. That's kind of the whole point of it. Nothing to do with your your education, your background, the color of your skin, the size of your kitchen, the number of clothes in your cupboard. The roots to the good life are precisely the same, whether you are a kid in rural Kenya or a banker living on Battledown, and all points in between. But our culture continues to shout at us. Upgrade your life by upgrading your stuff, and if you don't upgrade your stuff, you'll downgrade your life. Kingdom culture, God's kingdom culture shouts back, or maybe whispers back, actually. And we need to lean in our ears to hear it. But the message is clear. No, upgrade your life through more simplicity, not more stuff. Maybe other roots too, but that's what this message is is around in this In this series, there is a practice called simplicity, if you like, living simply, amongst others, that can help us to be more free from the tyranny of affluenza, more liberated from that virus in in, in society, more liberated from the cycle of dissatisfaction where we want stuff, we're promised stuff, we have it, and it doesn't deliver, so we, we want more and we get caught in that cycle. There is a practice that helps us to find more peace, more contentment, less bustle and hassle, wider margins. I love that phrase. Wider margins in life for enjoying God. For enjoying God. For enjoying one another. There is a practice that can help us with that. It's good news, isn't it? Would you turn to Luke 12 briefly? Don't have masses of time today. Try and cover the main ground, but leave you to fill in lots of gaps with the Holy Spirit. By the way, while you're finding Luke 12, uh, I read again this week, was reminded again this week, that of Jesus' teaching, roughly 25% covers money and stuff. And I was thinking if we uh, reflected that proportion up here uh, across the year, one in four messages was about money and stuff. I think the church would probably be a lot smaller. Um, but it's quite interesting that he says that. And Andrew asked a really good question. Do you have a help? If my, my way of saying it would be, do you have a good theology of money? Do you feel that your, your mind, you have a kingdom mindset, a God's kingdom mindset around money and stuff? Uh, and to what extent are you, uh, are you hungry and willing to learn in this rather sensitive area? And we know, friends, that it carries. Of course it does. This carries you know, a special power, doesn't it? Money and stuff. It just does to us. 
Different things hit different cultures. But money and stuff has a special power to make us feel a bit sort of sensitive and a bit nervy and a bit fearful and a bit judgmental very often. We start applying it to other people and not us and all of that. Let's ditch all of that stuff. We need a healthy theology of money. And, and Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about it a lot. Luke 12. I'll just go a little bit from this passage this morning. Uh, verse 13. It'll come up on the screen as well. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, would you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? Basically, Jesus, will you endorse my greed? Is the question he's asking. Uh, Jesus replies, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? But Jesus saying, No, that's not my job. That's not for me to do. But off the back of the question, so often he, he would go off the back of real questions, he turned it around and said, so he said to them, so watch out, and I'm going to repeat it because this really matters, pay attention, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. All kinds of greed, by the way, all kinds of greed. Greed comes in all kinds of different disguises, not just one. It's not about just overeating or whatever, whatever. What lust is to sexuality, somebody says, greed is to stuff and pleasure and comfort. It'll take different forms. Life, goes, Jesus continues, life, big word, does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Hear me say again, as Andrew's already said, he's not saying that money and possessions are bad, just that the good life that we are all after, that our hearts and souls crave, is not found there. More is not better. And then he tells the parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And I love, by the way, so to keep pausing, but I just want to pause as we go through. I, I love, of course, that the man worked hard with the ground, but who supplied the ground? And who supplied the rain? And who supplied the sun? And who supplied the, the seed? And who supplied the harvest? God is the ultimate one at work behind all of it, the ultimate provider of all of it, linking back to where Hills was speaking last week. So the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest by the grace of God. And he thought to himself, this rich man, what shall I do? I was reading a commentary which suggested in the culture of the day, which is agrarian and pre-redistribution uh, kind of, of wealth through the, a tax system, this would be a rhetorical question. What shall I do? It would be perfectly obvious. They'd be going, well, why are you asking that question? It's completely obvious. Because anybody who had some excess, who had surplus, who had more wealth, the expectation would be that they'd share it with the community that, around them who had need. Interesting. What shall I do? The passage in Greek, by the way, is full of I, me, mine. So to answer the question in which he did was really shocking. I've got no place to store my crops, says the guy. Translation, I've got affluenza. Translation, I'm driven by my inner desire for more and my fear of not having enough. Just think about those two desires, by the way. Your fear, sorry, your desire, your inner desire for more and your fear of not having enough, they're very linked, and we all have them. By the grace of God, they just need working on and refining. So the guy says, so of course I'm going to accumulate. This is what I'm going to do, verse 18. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, great, you've got plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Maybe well be a familiar story to us. Notice the shift, by the way, from this man's contribution through the work of his hands to consumption through hedonism. Big shift, as if the only goal of his work is his pleasure. Verse 20, love this, it's one of the but gods. Here it is. But God. But God. In Jesus' story. But God. Hang on then, reminder, uh, Madonna wasn't right that we only live in a material world and that it's all about what we can see, feel, touch, taste. But God comes into the equation. Reminder, there's more to life than all of that. In fact, the spiritual realities are even more real than the physical realities, if we read our scriptures. But God... It's got something to say about this. God said to him, you fool. By the way, that word, again, just means not, not just morally deficient, bad-hearted, greedy, selfish, but actually intellectually deficient. You're an idiot. 
is what God is saying to this guy. Because this night your life will be demanded from you and then he'll get what you've prepared for yourself. And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but isn't rich towards God. What is Jesus saying? The good life, and there is a good life, a good God life to be had. It's just not found through excess, through affluenza, through accumulation, through surplus wealth, through the the acquisition of more and more and more, whether it's things or experiences. And let's remind ourselves, friends, standards of living have consistently gone up. In the last 50 years especially, consistently, every so, the standard of living gone up and up and up in all of our lifetimes, up and up and up and up. And in every single survey that records these things, whether Christian or secular, the quality of life, the well-being of life, the happiness of people, however you measure it, every single survey has gone down and down and down and down within the same time period. You might have seen in the paper there was a massive lottery, I think it was the biggest lottery win ever this week. In the same article, I couldn't help noticing that the previous biggest win 2011, in this couple, uh, there's a couple in this country, 164 million they won. Five years later, they got divorced, that couple. I'm not making any judgments or coming to the crass conclusions about that, but let's just note it. Every single survey says the same basic thing, however you try to measure it. After your basic material needs are met and you've reached a, a modest standard where, yes, food is covered and health is covered and Housing is covered and warmth is covered and those things are covered. And yes, let's acknowledge that even in our own affluent culture, some of those things are not covered. And it's right that we continue to pay attention to that and to be sensitive around that. But once those needs have been met and once wealth is at that modest minimum level, every single survey says the same thing and has done for years. That more does not equal more happiness. In fact, once you get to a particular point, the curve starts to go down the other way. And more becomes less happiness and less sense of well-being. Really interesting. And we've heard it a thousand times. We have heard it, the variation of this a thousand times, haven't we? More money doesn't make you more happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can all, we can all trot out the mantra. Thing is that we, st- we still don't quite believe it. I think. Mammon is so powerful. Consumer, the consumer philosophy, the consumer culture, culture rests precisely on the belief and encouraging the belief in more and more sophisticated ways as we get more and more targeted, that upgrading your stuff does mean upgrading your life. And so affluenza is actually a really good disease to catch. You'll be happy when you just have a bit more because you don't quite have enough yet. Why do we have shops called Next and Gap? (laughs) One of the early advertising giants said this, Literally, we must shift the country from a needs culture to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire, to want new things, new experiences, even before the old ones are over. I believe that's called uh, planned obsolescence. We must shape a mentality where people's desires must dramatically overshadow their needs. Pretty sinister philosophy, isn't it, when you think about it? That was an advertising giant who said that a couple of decades ago. And it's happened. We know that. We go, yeah, that's happened. That's the culture, that's the air that we, that we breathe. One, one report estimates at the moment that the average one of us is exposed to 5,000 adverts of one type or another a day. 5,000 a day. Ever more cleverly targeted precisely to, you know, through data and all of that. Here's the chief executive of IKEA recently. In the West, we've reached peak stuff, but it doesn't stop us wanting more. The average home has 200,000 items in it, The average time spent consuming social media is two and a half hours a day. Uh, For those of us who have garages, only 18% of garages in this country are used for cars. 82% of garages, mine included, are used for storage. Interesting. Those who play video games do so on average 2.9 hours per day in our culture now. Etc. I've got a whole bunch of data and stats. They're, co- they're, they're slightly frightening in a way, but they, they need to shock us, I, I think. We need to allow ourselves to be shocked. And here's another shock. Shock horror. Jesus turned out to be right. <laughs> Didn't he? I mean, he turns out to be right. All the secular research, all, the, all of that stuff, all the social scientists 
Turns out that he's right. More money and stuff doesn't lead to the good life, even though it looks like it will. Jesus called it this. It's a brilliant phrase in the parable of the sower, the deceitfulness of wealth. Would you log that phrase? I found that a really powerful phrase to, to sort of dwell on a bit as I was thinking about this and praying about the deceitfulness of wealth. I gave a message here a few years ago, and I haven't got time to re-give that one, um, where, where I said that if money could talk, what would it say? An unredeemed money, worldly money, if you like, has a few chat-up lines, and they're all lies. They're all deceptions, the deceitfulness of wealth. They sound right to some extent, but they're all wrong, and we know where lies come from. The father of lies is the devil himself. I'll just put the headlines up on, on a slide. Unredeemed money says, idolize me. Kingdom culture would say, well, if you do that, you won't have possessions. They'll have you. Worship God. You can't do both. Not don't do both, by the way. Don't worship God and money. You can't worship God and money. Idolize me. It would say, unredeemed money would say, compare upwards with people who have more than you do. Kingdom culture would say, well, if you do that, that's a life of misery, jealousy, judgment, all of that. That is such a terrible route to go down. Just be thankful for all that God provides, whatever the level. A billion people, by the way, live on less than a dollar a day in our world. So we're going to compare at all, compare down, not up. Unredeemed money says, worry about me. Kingdom money says, pray about me. It's quite a big difference, isn't there? <laughs> and trust God. Worldly money says, I'm all yours. So you can use me for whatever you like, especially your own pleasure and comfort. Kingdom money says, everything that you've got has been given to you by God. And not just the 10%, by the way, that you might give away. All of it. We talk about the 10% quite often. We don't seem to talk about the, the 90% that much, as if we can, we're free to do exactly what we want with that for our own pleasure and gratification. No. All of it's lent to us by God. Shock, horror. Jesus was right. He was even right, by the way, when he said it's more blessed to give than receive. The roots of more happiness and well-being, part of the good life, is accessed by even more by giving away stuff than it is by receiving. Worldly money says, yeah, sure, be generous if you like, but not yet because you haven't got enough yet. You'll be more generous when you've got more. Such a deceptive lie. Absolute nonsense. Kingdom money says, don't be so insulting to generous poor people. Generosity is not about how much you've got, but the proportion that you give. It's an attitude, not an amount. So, and on and on, I could, I could put some more up. The deceitfulness of wealth, the false god of more. Here's John Mark Comer, uh, who's written brilliantly on this. And I should say, by the way, if we want more resources on this and to land it practically, because I'm not going to do much of that, I haven't got time today, uh, head, head to Bridgetown Church and, and, and look at the practices of simplicity. Um, we've got some of them on our website, and they're kind of half borrowed from theirs as well. John Mark Comer says this, when the external pull of propaganda... That's advertising and the underlying message of you know, never enough. And the internal push of greed come together. The result is the sabotage of the very life that we all crave. I know I'm painting a really challenging picture, friends, and this was not, not I would far rather have been given a different topic to speak on this morning. <laughs> You know, these are kind of, oh, Lord, you know, you always have to speak to yourself. And, you know, I, there's my garage, one of the 82% full of stuff. So, uh, you know, I'm speaking to, so I know, I know that it's challenging. But I think, and I think unless we grasp what Jesus, I mean, Jesus was doing it, so I make no apology. Unless we grasp something of what, what the, our culture, the culture that we're in, something of this deceptiveness and something of the lure and the pull. And kingdom culture is completely 180 degrees opposite Unless we get some sort of big why, this kind of stuff can just become about good behavior and just you know, try a bit harder, do a bit better, give a bit more money away, you know, try and buy less stuff, as if it's about the behavior. It really isn't. It's about the, the inner attitude, isn't it, and the heart. So let me just, in a few minutes, paint a, a little bit of a counter picture, this practice of simplicity. And when I say practice, let's remember, uh, these are not virtues. You can, you can practice any, all practice, you, know, you can fast and tithe and do simplicity in Bible reading and still be a horrible person. Uh, so practices... <laughs> Oh, uh, well, you can. <laughs> Practices are healthy habits, as we call them here. They're, they're just channels. They're a means to an end. They're channels that release the grace of God into our lives. Please let's see them like that, not just as a tick list. They release the grace of God, the empowering presence of God into our lives, all of them. Simplicity does that, and the means to the end. What's the end? The end is to know him better. This is life, says Jesus, that you may know me and become more like me. 
That's the end. And these are just goals to it. So simplicity sits in that, in that range. And it's not about minimalism, by the way. It's not the fashionable, trendy thing. It's not the Marie Kondo decluttering, all of that kind of stuff. Although decluttering might well be a helpful part of it. It's not an eco-strategy that's driven by care for the environment, although that's also a pretty good part and aspect of it. It's not actually a behavior, like I've just said, it's the outworking of a heart. A heart that agrees with Jesus 100% that affluenza is harmful. It's a disease that rots us from the inside and our culture. So we agree with Jesus. It's, a heart, it's the outworking of a heart attitude, not just a bit of good behavior. And, and it's one that yearns for connection and contentment with him. And it's not about giving everything away, although God might ask some to do that. He's not after our money. Andrew said it. The Lord is not after our money. I know churches can give that impression sometimes. He is not after our money. And he doesn't condemn anybody who has loads of it. But he is after our hearts. He's after our hearts. So he loves us far too much to leave us with the idea that if, we're, if, if our hearts are, are, are full of one kind of a thing, then they can also be full of him. They can't. To be consumed by him... We need to be rid of the consumption of being consumed by other things, including money and stuff. Loads of Bible verses. haven't got time to, to, to show them now, but I'll just put one up. He, if you could have Cheryl, uh, Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content, there's a good word, with what you have. And I, lo- I never noticed the second part of this verse. Have you seen this? Because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. It's linked with the presence of God. It's not just good, good, this is what good Christians do. Don't worry about the stuff. No, it's linked about the presence of God. I'm with you. I'm your provider. I'm your protector. Put your focus on me. And you can be free from this, the love of money. Not free from money. None of us want to be free from money. Poverty is not a blessing. Poverty is a curse. It's not being free from money. It's free from the love of money. Here's a couple of def- John Mark Comer's definition, two definitions of simplicity. The intentional promotion of things we most value. What do you most value? The intentional reduction of the things then that most distract us from them. Second quote, quite practical. Intention, that's the same word again. Intentionality, none of this happens automatically, obviously. Intentionally arranging our life around God. Well, that's a great sentence right there. Intentionally arranging our life around God. Limiting Ooh, don't want limits. Limiting the number of our possessions, expenses, activities, social obligations to a level where we are free to live joyfully and peacefully in the kingdom with Jesus. And I would put simplicity, living simply, which I continue to aspire to do. It's a work in progress. As perhaps one of the key tools to creating margin to creating precisely this kind of space, might even be physical space as a reflection of inner space for arranging my life around the Lord. Paul says he learned to be content. I'm quite encouraged by that. He learned to be content. You can't buy contentment. You can't buy it with money. Culture wants to say you can buy contentment with money and stuff. We go, no, 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 you can't. But neither is contentment a gift that God just drops and go, oh, suddenly you're content. No, he learns to be content. He went through some ups and downs, but got his, himself to a place where whether having a lot or a little, it didn't affect the inner harmony of his heart because that heart was full of the Lord and not full of thoughts about stuff. So I need to wrap up. Um, the Lord needs to minister to us all here and onwards. Will we learn a bit more, I suppose is what I want to say. So will we learn a bit more? How about, church family, a little bit of an experiment? How about we experiment with this? I can't tell you what that experiment will be because it will apply differently. You'll be hearing this differently to your, to your context. How about an experiment, though, to see if Jesus was right? What do we think? To see if Jesus was right. Or whether actually secretly we still think he got a lot of things right, but he got this one wrong. <laughs> Might we ask the Holy Spirit what, what a next step would look, like, look, would look like towards a simpler life, towards living simply, where we would be less vulnerable 
to affluenza. Starting where we're at, ditching the shame and the guilt and the condemnation, which can be associated with this kind of thing. Oh, no, I'm a terrible person. I've been trying to do this for 30 years, and I've got even more stuff. In fact, I need a double garage for all my stuff. (laughs) Ditch all of that. It's not helpful. But could we do that thing of praying that we would be able to walk with the Lord as they did on the Emmaus Road, that we would walk in step with the Spirit? Would we ask him to show us where we might be trying to build bigger and bigger barns? What's our susceptibility? Could be stuff, could be money, could be experiences, could be all sorts of things. So that instead of filling up the spaces in our heads and our homes with more, we create more space for our hearts to be filled with more of him.